All right, good morning and happy Tuesday. So we are finally leaving the work of Edmund Spencer and we are gonna be taking a look at um, another dude that I really like, one of these Renaissance sonnet writers, and that is a guy named Sir Philip Sidney. Um, today, we're gonna to be taking a look at Sonnet 31, which is on pages 12 and 13 in your packet online. Let's see if I can move my screen here. All right, so a little bit of background about this new person that you're meeting. So the sonnet sequence that he's most famous for is called Astrophel and Stella, okay? It contains 108 uh, sonnets and 11 songs. The title of this comes from two Greek words, aster, which means star, and phil means lover, so star lover, and the Latin word stella means star. In this particular collection between these two fictional, you're gonna learn not that fictional people in a moment, um, Astrophel is the star lover and Stella is his star. Now, what is this inspired by? Well, here's a case where we do have a sonnet sequence that's written by someone who can't actually be with the person they love. So this is different than Edmund Spencer. So um, in, this was all inspired by a woman named Penelope Devereaux, and she kind of is, she's Stella in this little fictional uh, set of lovers that is presented in this sequence. Um, now, Sir Philip Sidney had been engaged to her, but it was broken off, not really because of a fight, but just because of some other things. She marries another man. He can never be with her then. But, dot, dot, dot. For many readers, um, Stella's name is always associated with Astrophil. So in a sense, the two of them are always linked together. And so you really kind of see the, the, the timelessness of poetry here and what Sydney's able to achieve. Sydney's sonnets are written in what's known as the Petrarchan sonnet form. Um, Petrarch was a, was a sonnet writer in the Italian Renaissance, which preceded the, the English Renaissance that we're studying from. And um, it's also called the Italian sonnet for that reason. Still have 14 lines, still have iambic pentameter, but the way in which the sonnet is broken down is a little bit different. We will not see interlocking quatrains anymore. We will instead see a group of eight and a group of six, okay? And I'll, I'll show you the, the rhyme scheme for that after we take a look at the first sonnet. Um, for this particular sonnet, and it's sonnet 31, Astrophil, who is the speaker, is lovesick, you know, for Stella. And he is looking up at the moon, and he thinks the moon looks like it might understand how he's feeling. You know, he looks up at that moon, and it looks pale and sad. And, and, and the speaker's going to reflect on the fact that, you know, the moon's been around a while. It probably, you know, knows what lovesickness looks like. It must know how he feels. After all, the moon's been there forever, and it has seen all these humans, you know, go through this stuff. And then at the end of the sonnet, he's going to, you know, if the moon looks about as lovesick as he feels, he's going to start asking some, question about, some questions about, like, are the women up there like the women down here? Because you're going to see that the speaker, Astrophel in this case, does not understand what's going on with Stella. So let's go ahead and read it. All right, Sonnet 31 by Sir Philip Sidney. With how sad steps, O moon, thou climbest the skies, how silently and with how wan a face. What? May it be that even in heavenly place that busy archer his sharp arrows tries? Sure, if that long with love acquainted eyes can judge of love, thou feelest a lover's case, I read it in thy looks. Thy languish grace to me that feel the like, thy state decries. Then, even a fellowship, O moon, tell me, is constant love deemed there but want of wit? Are beauties there as proud as here they be? Do they above love to be loved, and yet those lovers scorn whom that love doth possess? Do they call virtue there ungratefulness? All right. So our first question, um, first thing we're going to do to kind of uh, illustrate the this new sonnet form. Again, still a sonnet, still 14 lines, still iambic pentameter, but the rhyme seems going to be different than what we've taken a look at. So let's take a look at our rhymes. So I've got skies and tries eyes and decries, but it stops there. I don't see any other rhymes with that. Um, let me go to my next sound. Face, place, case, grace. And then I don't see it there anymore. I see me and B. Those go together. Wit and yet are close enough. Possess ungratefulness. Okay. Here's where we will see the Italian sonnet form. 
Okay. The first eight lines, we see a pattern of A, B, B, A, but then it keeps going A, B, B, A. That lumps those first eight lines all together. And we call that an octave. Like an octagon has eight sides. Um, an octopus has eight tentacles. An octave has, it's a group of eight lines that follow the same pattern. Okay. Now, in the Italian sonnet, the sestet rhyme scheme is not real set in stone, okay? It, and you can, uh, my picture's covering up my explanation of it here, but I'll attach the Google Drive, uh, I'm sorry, the, the slideshow presentation separately to Google Classroom. Um, the sestet is a group of six lines that are really any variety of, of, of C, D, and E, okay? Um, in this case, we have C, D, C, D, E, E. But it could have been C, D, E, C, D, E. It doesn't have to be an exact scheme uh, that's the same, as long as though it's a collection of those three syllables together. Now, I feature this up here now. Again, the Petronat sonnet format um, has the octave and the sestet. But look at that explanation of those remaining six lines, that sestet. And, and ses, in this case, is six. It says it can have either two or three rhyming sounds arranged in a variety of ways. Okay. So if you take a look at the last one featured there, we just had C, D, C, D, E, E, but it could be a variety of other things. But again, 8 plus 6 is 14, so there's our sonnet form. Um, yes. Okay, so let's take a look. Our first question is very straightforward. We've just discussed it. It says identify the rhyme scheme and the type of sonnet. So you're going to copy down that letter pattern, and you're going to identify this as the Italian or Petrarchan sonnet. Again, the terms for those are interchangeable. All right, question two. It says, what does the speaker think he has in common with the moon? And on what does the speaker base this assumption given the moon's physical appearance? So I've highlighted some things up here uh, out of the poem that I think highlight and answer this question. Um, the speaker here thinks that the moon is lovesick like he is. You know, and if you take a look in lines um, three and four, he says, what? May it be that even in heavenly place that busy archer his sharp arrows tries? Who's the little busy arrow shooting archer that when it hits people, they fall in love and they get lovesick? Cupid. Okay, that's what that's a reference there too. And that second question says, on what does the speaker base this assumption given the moon's physical appearance? He's moving slowly as he climbs the skies. It's, he's moving silently. His face is wan, which means pale. It says he has a languished grace. To languish is to droop, okay? So the moon looks like it's moping around, and that's exactly how the speaker Astrophel feels um, in, this, in his current circumstance. Question three says, how does the sonnet function as an apostrophe? So we talked about this as one of Spencer's poems. Um, I'm not talking about the, the punctuation mark, the little thing in the, that shows possession or a contraction. But instead, in this case, I'm talking about a literary device in which an absent person, place, or abstraction is stressed or I'm sorry, is addressed as if it were alive and present. It's like saying, keys, where, where are you? Or phone, why won't you charge better? Or something like that. Um, it's pretty obvious in this case. I've highlighted it for you. He speaks directly to the moon as if it's alive. That makes this an apostrophe. All right, question four. What ability does the speaker assume Cupid's arrows have the power and strength in terms of traveling distance to do? He's pretty impressed that Cupid's arrows are strong enough and powerful enough to even reach the heavens because the moon looks like it's lovesick too, just like he feels. Question five. The speaker describes the moon's eyes as long with love acquainted. If the moon had eyes. Obviously with apostrophe, you often have personification too, but those are technically separate things in the literary analysis world. So the question is this, how would the moon be long with love acquainted considering the length of its existence? And I try to paraphrase that question. Has it had the opportunity to observe few lovers or many lovers in its existence? All right, think of how long the moon has been facing the earth, okay? So the moon has been long acquainted with love. He knows what it looks like because the moon is always facing the earth and he's seen generations and generations of lovers through the years. So that's what that statement uh, means and that he could judge love and he could feel a lover's case, you know, and the, the speaker says, I, I can tell in your looks that you know, okay? All right, question six says this. You know how you can oftentimes tell if something's wrong just by the look on someone's face? I want you to take a moment to look through the lines 
to, in which the speaker expresses this to the moon. And it's conveyed in two complete lines of uh, the text. So I'm going to give you a moment to look for that. Did you find it yet? Was that an awkward silence? It kind of was. I think this is the place where we really see it. The speaker says, I read it in thy looks. Thy is an old fashioned word for your. Your languished grace to me that feel the like, you feel the same as me. Your state decries. I can see from your face, you know what I'm talking about. Okay. Question seven. Okay, I say just kidding because there's not actually a question where it says question seven. So I just am going to read through this. You don't have anything to fill in on your worksheet for this. It says when the speaker um, wraps up the sonnet with a series of questions for the moon, inquiring whether the state of affairs there in the heavenly realms is as it is on earth. Um, through these questions about the heavenly realm, the speaker essentially tells us what's going on in his earthly situation. And I just wanted to point that out. We're going to look at these questions. I've highlighted them in four different colors um, on your screen. You know, the first question he wants to know if it's true up there, because we can then assume it's true for him on earth. Is constant love deemed there but want of wit? Are beauties there as proud as they hear, as here they be? Do they, again, these beautiful women, do they up in the heavens above love to be loved? And yet those lovers scorn whom that love doth possess. And up there, do they call virtue their ungratefulness? We're not going to look at all of them, but I wanted to point that out to you. Question eight. The speaker obviously feels constant love for someone. Based on this question, what can the reader infer he has been criticized or mocked for because he's remained faithfully devoted uh, to in this case. I want you to look specifically at the line I have highlighted and that 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 uh, bolded underlined part. He says, is constant love deemed there but want of wit? All right, in this case, wittiness is intelligence. And if you are in want of it, you are considered dumb. Okay. So what you kind of see going on here is that he's asking the question to the moon, like up there in the heavens, do people, do women view your constant devoted love to them as just stupidity and stupidness? She obviously must be rejecting him here. Um, so that's what we can put down for question eight. Um, and then eight B, I'm sorry, that was just eight A, eight B. He asks, are beauties there as proud as here they be? Okay, we're not talking about proud, like you're really proud of somebody's accomplishment, but proud, like you think you're better than everybody. Okay, and that's what you can kind of figure is going on between Astrophel and Stella in this particular sonnet. You know, are the beautiful women up in the heavens? Are they? Are they too good for everybody like, like Stella is for me? Okay. And, and you could see that next question too. I just want to highlight it. I don't have a question for it, but it's a good one. Um, this question. He says, do they above love to be loved? And yet those lovers scorn whom that love doth possess. So if you had to like paraphrase that, that basically means like do, he's asking the moon, do the beauties and the women up there, do they really love to be loved because they like the attention? But then do they scorn the actual lovers that love them? Like, do they actually not like the people that are showing them that love? It just doesn't make much sense to him. Okay. Um, and again, you can kind of break it down. I, I, I broke it down there again for you to kind of see those two points. Um, I don't really know what to do with that last line. Do they call virtue their ungratefulness? Um, I think that the speaker Astrophel thinks, you know, he's showing virtue and showing his constant true love to her. But for some reason, she's just telling him he's ungrateful or not good or something. Not quite sure about that one. All right. And question nine. So this just asks you to summarize what this sonnet is about in two to three sentences. And you guys should have a pretty good sense of that um, at this point. So that's Sir Philip Sidney. We're going to take a look one more, uh, one more sonnet from him. We'll take a look at that on Wednesday. And then we're on to our man Shakespeare on Thursday and Friday. And not that anybody has it marked on their calendar, but Thursday is Shakespeare's birthday. So maybe we'll do some kind of little random extra credit thing related to Shakespeare that day.
Okay. Um, text me with questions. Um, reach out to me. Make sure that you remember to watch that little uh, video I have attached to this assignment as well um, about Shakespeare and iambic pentameter. And also um, there's a little quizzes with five questions that go with it. The quizzes is set to give you a lot of time. So take your time taking it. It's not really meant to be a quiz per se, but um, you really do it while you're watching it. Okay. All right. Bye guys.